Thank you for tuning in to Sparks and Honey's Daily Culture Briefing. My name is Ben Grinspan, and today we're going to be looking at culture in the vertical, using Q, our cultural intelligence platform, to unpack trends and changes in human behavior. And joining me today uh, as my co-briefer is the wonderful Matt Adams. We're also joined by our cultural experts, Ketsi Tipe, making a, uh, a, a one of two appearances uh, this week. Uh, we're joined by Jen Jin uh, on her very first culture briefing. Thank you for letting me do this to you, Jen. <laughs> I really appreciate your presence here. And then we also have a new friend to Sparks and Honey, Daniel Seberg. He is the uh, co-founder and CMO of Good Trust, uh, which is a startup that helps people uh, plan uh, plan for their forever. Can I call it that? Does that make sense? The inevitability of what faces us all. Yeah. Death, if I can say that word. I think it's all right. Uh, okay. It's okay. And you know. uh, ensuring that you're protected with... Uh, everything you need to take care of. So, yeah, including your memories, of course, which is what we're going to talk about. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, Daniel brings a smiling face to, uh, to, to, a, to a complex <laughs> subject. You have to have a sense of humor when you talk about death. I've, I've learned this the, the hard way. Uh, yes. It helps. So. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, with that in mind, let's talk about today's subject, which is uh, digitizing memory. We get a chance to think a lot about digital culture here and, uh, you know, the ways in which history impacts our lives. But what I really wanted to dig in, because I'm very interested in this, like, just on a personal level and part of this was a conversation that Daniel and I were having about in some ways so much of what we do on social media if we're not looking for something or buying something is memorializing things you know we have really developed an incredibly strong ecosystem uh, in today's culture to digitize memory it's a really core human instinct to try to remember things and there are lots of really interesting politics and innovation about what memory means and where memory is going so today we wanted to explore that I'm really excited for our you know our social media clients our clients who think a lot about provenance and about history uh, to, to dig into this so uh, I'm excited and you know we always start with a, uh, a general question here and so our guiding question is what is the cultural what what cultural value value does digitizing memory provide and how might innovations and social change impact what I think you know we all know to be this deeply human process the the caves at Lascaux was our first attempt uh, to, to uh, memorialize things and now we're all doing it on uh, you know on Instagram and perhaps to lesser effect on be real um, <laughs> So let's dive on in here and look at our, our trend map here. This is our system uh, allowing us to kind of get our heads around what it means to memorialize things. And, you know, it's, it's written in, um, Matt put together this Boolean, but it's, it's an interesting mix of asking ourselves questions about technology, about memorializing, and even questions like terms like remembrance and heritage, uh, which we'll definitely get into. Um, I, you know, I, I think in part uh, the system is tagging meme culture, which is our element of culture about you know, the ways in which memes uh, help us express ourselves really highly here, I think in part because of some of the terms we're using. But also we have to remember that memes are now a critical part of us processing memory and, and, and history today. So Matt, what other EOCs here do you like, do you think are important for us to, to think about? Uh, the big one for me is NetAge spirituality and also moral imperative. NetAge spirituality, because when you think of forever, a lot of that comes with what do you believe in the afterlife? What do you believe when it comes to what you want your legacy to be on this planet? Yeah. And then when it comes to moral imperative, what are the responsibilities we have to the legacies that we leave? Or how do we shape the legacies that we're interacting with yeah, on this that. land. So, yeah. And, you know, uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled the system pulled up our EOC and the 2% there, holistic death, thinking a little bit differently about uh, about it. And uh, uh, Jen, in part, we, we brought her on because uh, some of the first work she did at Sparks and Honey was talking about that. So I'm going to rely on you to give us some good cultural uh, uh, conversation around that. Mm -hmm. um, but let's start here because I think this is a really, usually we start with one of these big things to set uh, the stage, but I, I wanted to start here with a pretty niche article uh, today. So that photo you see here of the guy with the selfie stick is uh, Prince William Rudolph uh, Luboko Lubkowitz. There we go, Lubkowitz. He is a 27-year-old prince of Bohemia, which makes up much of modern-day Czech Republic. Um, and he's doing something pretty audacious. So Lubkowitz and his two sisters and their parents uh, have dedicated their life's work to maintaining their ancestral royal heritage, right? They have three castles, one palace, 20,000 movable artifacts, a library of 65,000 rare books, 5,000 beautiful uh, musical artifacts and compositions, including one of the very first copies of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And they're all stored away in about 30,000 boxes in addition to the real estate. So 
There's a lot to preserve here, right? And he's doing it in a way that's thoroughly modern by embracing NFTs. Quote, it's not just about selling NFTs to support cultural monuments, uh, but it's uh, looking at how do we preserve our record and our history in a way that's modern, Lubkowitz told CNBC. Quote, blockchain technology provides an immutable record uh, of our cultural heritage, which can preserve on the chain. Uh, and that's something that's never been done before. Um, and this is where we, uh, you know why we're starting our, our, our briefing today with all in all in in of all places like a Czech castle where this photo is taken. Right, memories are inherently valuable and are things we often tie to physical attributes, products, uh, you know, actual photos. But they can also be uh, much harder to digitize. Sometimes they're experiences. Sometimes they're uh, they're knowledge. And and it's really interesting to see this young prince, you know, somewhere between a Gen Zer and a millennial, thinking that NFTs and that innovation might be the right way uh, to do that. So Daniel, um, you know, as we said, your startup focuses on, uh, on legacy building. Uh, I don't know how many members of your, uh, of your community are, are European royalty, uh, but it seems like everybody might have a stake in this. And so I guess my question is, what is your take on sort of innovative tools like NFTs to, to, to maybe preserve some of our cultural memory? And, and what and more than that, maybe what culture, why do we have that cultural imp impulse to preserve all of, all of this stuff? What, what is the fundamental core to, to this and why we might be looking at some of these innovations? Yeah, I wonder if it speaks to just our universal desire to be remembered, yeah. which is something that we've discovered in conversations with people who are in palliative care or facing end of life challenges, that if you ask people you know, what it is you'd like to pass on, it's their story, yeah. it's their memories, it's their experiences. And I mean, in a, in a sense, it sort of makes makes sense that NFTs are maybe this new vessel yeah. to mm -hmm. transport those memories through time. It feels maybe a little more permanent than something on paper. And you know, you referenced all of the artifacts that they have that are stored away somewhere. Yeah. So maybe it's easier to share something like an NFT or yeah. to verify it, you know, through a, a blockchain provenance. But um, I think it, it it really speaks to something that we all feel. In this case, it's, you know, a higher profile person with maybe, you know, obviously more money and more right. means to create some of this than the rest of us. Um, but I think it's something we can perhaps relate to, if not quite on this level of, yeah. you know, grandeur and royalty. But, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pat, you thought? Uh, I just think it's interesting when you're talking about the digital being a little bit more permanent than, like, say, paper, because at the end of the day, like, what's digital has to be stored in tech boxes that are surrounded by all this, like, uh, insulation so that things don't burn and stuff like that. So it's, it's going to be really interesting to see how we deal with, mm. how do we actually crystallize what is forever with digital yeah. technology because there's still so much wrong with how we store things with NFTs as well. That's incredibly unsustainable for our planet at the current moment. So it's going to, we have to think about how can we be sustainable in preserving our legacy for the long run. Yeah, and I think yeah. that raises an interesting tension that we're actually going to talk about mm -hmm. in the next signal, which is the tension between the desire to preserve something physical and have it be limited to where that physical object can go, and the desire to digitize something which can kind of go anywhere but then loses mm -hmm. some of that viscerality, you know, some of that sense that so it loses a little bit of that, that magic. And that's a really interesting tension, especially, again, as we jump into this, uh, this signal about uh, the exact opposite, uh, baby food. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this next signal here is talking about, you know, how should we work with our children and when it comes to memorializing them on the internet. And this is really in, this is really important too when Ben talks about memory being so inherently valuable, we have to think about that from the very beginning of memory which is childhood. So there's a growing number of parents who, for various reasons, are backing away from online sharing, particularly because when social media transitioned from being a place where we're trying to catch up with our college friends or catch up with what, the news, what news is going on, it completely transformed into an everything, everywhere, all at once situation. But people didn't really have the security awareness to know where my memory is actually going to end up on the internet. So as friends and family, have started to tag photos. They inadvertently revealed personal details, which inevitably threatens the safety of the family and all involved. So Stacey B. Steinberg, the author of a recent study on children's privacy in the digital age, speaks to this digital act of memorializing 
adolescents as non-consensual. If we're not actually uh, getting the, cons you know, if we're not actually talking to our kids about their, their presence online, it's an issue of bodily autonomy right from the beginning. So I know this is a pretty personal decision at the end of the day for anyone who has kids, but, you know, I, I think, especially for you, since you have kids, if you can, you know, jump in here in at fact. the beginning. <laughs> yeah, and they're in the audience. Yeah. Right yeah. behind me. Yeah, I so. I feel their eyes boring into the back of my skull. <laughs> about this. Yeah. Because I do, I do share you know, stories about them and photos, so. Yeah. But, yeah, sorry. Continue. Yeah, I mean, yeah. thank you for sharing that, too, because yeah. I'm curious to know, like, how will you balance security for your kids in the future with online sharing? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great question, and um, mm -hmm. I'm sure they're listening right now. Um, you know, my hope is that um, it, it helps to preserve the memories in a more sort of a, a shared way, so mm -hmm. I try to have... Uh, closed or, you know, private uh, social sharing. Yeah. It's at least with people who I know something about. Ideally, it's not sort of open to everybody. Um, and, you know, these days, I, my family lives in Western Canada, and so they don't really have an opportunity to see their grandkids or their nieces uh, as often as I might like. So in some ways, this is how they kind of get to see some of that. It's yeah. not ideal. Um, but it, and it also, I think, has, for me, has become a bit of a scrapbooking uh, experience. Now, we can talk about algorithms all day long. I think, yeah. you know, Inst Instagram has pivoted away from this kind of idea of a place mm. where you might share all of this and people don't see them as often. So, or, you know, but for me, it's a it's a great way to remember what happened uh, during a particular occasion or an event, um, and you know through good trust. I mean, through our platform, we want to encourage people to think about it in this kind of like a almost like a campfire way, right? So if you imagine that one, if we were all sitting around a campfire. Mm. You know, in the early days of humans, right? You, right the yeah. fire would illuminate the people around the, the campfire, and you could kind of get a sense of these are the people who you could trust, I suppose, or mm. read their, you know, their facial, you know, expressions and all of that. And so, in a way, what we'd like to do with Good Trust is to think about these kind of campfires that you just set up private sharing with, you know, a limited group of people. Yeah. So it doesn't feel like it's kind of gone off into places that you don't know and yeah. uh, have some control over it. But yeah. I'll, I'll add very quickly. I have a friend who's on a social media. She has a child. They're on a social. She's on a social media network. I think it's called Beans, where basically it is a very small uh, social media network where it allows you to show photos of your kids. And what she said is, it's funny because she has privacy concerns, but also she's like, she did say she is not much of a photographer, and she's like, it's nice to know I can just send out the worst photos. <laughs> you know, there's no editing involved. Jen, what are your thoughts on this signal? I think like the issue of consent doesn't stop with just kids. Um, mm -hmm. I think with the rise of TikTok and kind of the pivoting of things that you post turning into content that could become viral overnight, yeah. there's this issue of like, if you're in the public, does anyone, can anyone just like videotape you or photograph you and put it online? So yeah. I think the, cons the issue of consent touches on everyone. And recently, like with the public health crisis of monkeypox, a video went viral on TikTok of someone videotaping another person who had visible scars. Mm. And it turned out that that person was actually healing from a tumor. So mm. it really is like that's going to be her memory yeah. that lives on that social media site. So mm. then it's like once you put it on, it doesn't, you can never really erase it. Yeah. I also yeah. have, yeah. <laughs> um, I think it's also interesting um, what you're saying about um, how we'd like to be remembered um, on social media. I think that there's a bigger cultural phenomenon going on where we have more control over how we're being remembered and sort of um, crafting that as well. Um, I think just having more involvement of what you'd like to remember and how you would like to be remembered is mm -hmm. something um, that's emerging, and it would be interesting to see the cultural shift um, change that over time and how you'd like to change the narrative of yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think that empowerment of, sorry, of people's identity or how they're remembered, right? I mean, these days you have a verification of your your Twitter account or whatever it is, right, that says this is who you are. Yeah. What about when you're gone? And, and how do we ensure yeah. that it's an accurate representation of who you are, who you want to leave behind? 
Uh, it's something we think a lot about, how to create those either signals of trust or mm -hmm. verification. Does the family need to give approval of, we you know, the photos or the videos that represent who you are and your stories? Do you do that while you're still alive? Yeah. Um, how can we kind of put that into the hands of the people who, who want it? I think all three of these, of your comments, and certainly this article, all go back to that idea of agency, that people want to have a say in what is memorialized, right? And, and, and that might, you know, and that is, has some really important questions about consent, about who's there, uh, and ultimately about, like, how performative uh, we are. And I don't know, let's, let's talk about our next signal here about um, uh, memorializing sobriety, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, I guess on the topic of performance and yeah. how we present ourselves in public, when we think about our ability to memorialize ourselves digitally, so much of that has been through Instagram and TikTok and other forms like that. But it's grown into this space where we're able to share our food, share our drinks, and share all these things about how we feel like we should be having fun. So in a response to all of that media around drinking culture and partying and smoking, a lot of youth appear to have adopted a very different approach to alcohol and consumption through sobriety. Uh, so this change, in and this change in attitude towards drinking has created a new breed of sober social media influencers with the hashtag Sober Curious, which has over 105 million, which has been viewed over 105 million times, while the phrase Sober TikTok has received a massive 589 million views. So this is, you know, this is a pretty large shift that we're seeing when it comes to the topic of sobriety. And I, there is this quote here from one of the Gen Zers in this article that says, for me at the weekend, I no longer have to worry about waking up with a completely blacked out memory. Not knowing what I did the night before, the post night, our fear, you sometimes you've been drinking too much. So it's interesting to see this connection to uh, physical memory in association to digital memory um, as there's a cultural shift around uh, capturing these sober curious lifestyles. So I have been fascinated about how human wellness has been kind of an alt value for Gen Z at the moment. So I wonder how could you see innovators in digital memory also supporting physical memory as well and how we keep that up? Is there a responsibility there? I mean, I'll start really quickly here by, by saying that it's, it's so funny to read this article and think, as, as a millennial, you know, in the ad, like, I got, in, I got uh, Facebook the summer before college, right? That's when it sort of came out, and there was a lot of finger-wagging about, like, what you post on there. And at first, you didn't have to worry, because Facebook was just for your friends in college, and then obviously it expanded, and suddenly you had to become a lot more conscious about, like, the photos of you with the red solo cup. But I also think there's an interesting sense to, like, so instead of looking like you're trying to avoid sort of that content and being avoid photographed with that, I do think that there's something great in this signal about people, you know, who choose to be sober, um, feeling like they have the actually, they can kind of flaunt it, that it's not just like hiding whatever your relationship with drinking is, but it's actually being sort of like honest and maybe even aspirational about that. I, I don't know, I'm curious your thoughts on, on memorializing that. Yeah, so uh, another full disclosure, I, I quit drinking more than five years ago. So I, I appreciate what these 20-somethings uh, are, are doing. And, and I think, you know, uh, philosophically, I love that they're sharing that and, and, and comfortable doing it. Uh, I think it helps anybody else to make that uh, decision. I, um, you know, I'm representing the Gen X uh, crowd love here. It. So, love it. Yeah. But, um, you know, back when we were 20-somethings, of course, we didn't have to worry about people, you know, having a digital hangover, right, where the next day you're like, oh, what did I post? What's going to be, you know, what's going to be shared about me? Yeah. And so I think there's a, maybe a recognition that, that you need to be a little more sensitive to, you know, what's happening, and uh, maybe this is a good way to counteract that. And um, yeah. I, yeah, so I, I... I'm curious if either of you on our social teams have talked about this digital hangover. I love that term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not, n not yet, but um, uh, one thing... <laughs> But one thing that did strike me, what you said, Matt, was blackout and um, how Gen Zers don't want to do that anymore because it's associated with alcohol. And kind of like if there's a sort of shift towards like just holding your memories with you, because I feel like there's a lot of when you drink, there's a lot of carelessness around like what your memory could be. And I think um, just saying that you want to keep it and preserve it um, means a lot than just sort of wanting to discard it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it goes back to that agency we were talking about earlier about yeah. wanting to. And that's why 
That's why in some ways, like, close friends on Instagram works, because you may show a slightly different, less public-facing side for you, and, you know, you can be on a platform and want to have tears of how much you're going to expose about yourself, and clearly these people feel comfortable building a, a profile around their sobriety, but others may want to be more quiet uh, about it, you know, and, and people should have the right to figure out how to memorialize that for themselves. Yeah, and I will just add that one of the reasons that I decided to stop drinking was that I felt like I wasn't remembering everything as much as I would like to. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, I mean, that's just sort of common sense. We all know that when you've had a few drinks, you know, your memory starts to blur and fade the next day. You're not really, you know, you can't recall exactly what you said and what you did. And so, and particularly I think as we all age, the value of your memories just goes up, yeah. I can tell you. Um, and, and so I think there's an opportunity there to, to really think about that for people of any age. But, yeah. yeah, kind of makes me want to look through my embarrassing drinking photos on my uh, Facebook and uh, see if any of them are actually worth preserving. Okay, so memory is political, right? Uh, this is an incredibly uh, valuable idea in the study of, of sort of politics and sociology. And how, who gets to remember things and how we remember things shapes that narrative, right? So that's why memory is so impactful in circumstances like the Russian invasion of Ukraine in, uh, that's discussed in this signal. Uh, quote, you see how many historical fake justifications there are for the Russian motivation for this war, um, the philosopher Anton Drobovich uh, told the New York Times. In peacetime, Mr. Drobovich led the Ukraine Institute for National Memory, an official institution tasked with re-examining the communist era uh, after years of whitewashes. Um, he switched from, uh, and this is not my joke, from think tank to blowing up tanks uh, as uh, he continues to work on memory and actually collecting an oral memory of this really fraught moment in, in Ukraine. And um, the battle here is both being fought on the streets of, you know, Kharkov or whatever, but also online with uh, Russian agents uh, and Ukrainians battling over who gets to define the stakes of the war, right? The Russian government wants to say there's one narrative. The Ukrainian, uh, you know, people want to say it's it's another. And memes, we saw meme culture earlier, like people are launching memes like they're launching Neptune missiles, you know, uh, all for the sake of kind of controlling how we how we understand how this conflict started. So, you know, um, this is in some ways a culture war, just as, uh, as, as this article uh, points out. And controlling the narrative can be really important in some ways for that broader cultural victory. So I guess the question is, can we expect uh, a lot more of this as we look into geopolitics and, and conflict, that there's going to be this real desire to like set the, um, you know, set what the memory is, set the narrative uh, online just as much as we're setting, you know, the front lines or, or whatever for, uh, for, for these actual conflicts. I don't know if anybody wants to, Jen, if you don't want to play uh, brief political scientist for me. Well, when I read the signal immediately, I was like, yeah, memories are propaganda and it can be, you know, used for good or used for evil. And I think it ties back to when meme culture showed up in the zeitgeist, it made like that was a through line for me because memes and memories and propaganda are all interconnected and how you use it and how you deploy it, especially in this day and age where everything's connected, you can receive news from anywhere and learn about anything. You really have a lot of power, um, you know, at your fingertips. Yeah, absolutely. Then, yeah, on the counter end of that, I completely agree with that. Um, on the counter end of that, because there's a lot of deregulation on the internet, they, they're even more contrast than before with um, maybe more control from governments, um, social forces, and then people online um, saying that didn't happen and, and there being sort of a contrast and um, kind of younger people from now trying having both at their disposal and deciding what was real and what was not and which one to choose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's sort of this, there's misinformation of the moment. So there's people debating, did this happen yesterday or an hour ago or whatever it is? And then there's, when we reflect back on something, how much does that change based on what was preserved, what was captured? You know, if we think... What if everybody had a smartphone during 9-11? And, and yeah. how many more of the sort of you know, perspectives would have been captured and would that have illuminated that event more for people? Would we have thought differently about what had happened or the Civil War or, you know, just to kind of look back at any moment in history, how would that have changed? And now we're in that going forward, right? We all do have smartphones. The average person, I think, takes about 20 photos per day. Yeah. And so we're all chroniclers of history and we all have our perspective and our point of view. And as people look back on what happened in our lifetimes, will that 
change? Will it feel more accurate because now everybody's capturing stuff? Or will it be harder to find those signals of truth and, and sift through it? I mean, uh, one of the, I was reading this article that said that one of the biggest strategic failures of the Russian war machine in this was, it, you know, not the, it wasn't happening, you know, it wasn't the mud on the ground or the, or the, the lousiness of their, like, artillery. It was the fact that they never shut, successfully shut down Ukrainian uh, 4G networks. That, like, if you don't shut that down, then you cannot control the image, the horrifying images coming out of Bucha or the, you know, the, the seizing of Mariupol or whatever. And it's like their inability to successfully do that is a fundamental disaster for them, at least geopolitically. They can still kill a lot of people, but they're not going to win the, you know, that, that war in that same way. And I'll, I'll, I'll you know, I think um, one thing we also want to talk about is memory isn't just geopolitical, it can be social politics too. Um, so a study of nearly a thousand adults found that exposure to interpersonal and institutional racism was associated with lower memory scores, and that experiences of structural racism were associated with lower episodic memory among all racial and ethnic groups that were included in this study. So it points to something that we've been talking about at Sparks and Honey for quite some time around biological and social determinants. We, have, we talk about this a lot with some of our, specifically our healthcare clients, that the zip code that you live in, the box that you check on the census can have really important and, and often negative uh, physiological impacts. And so I thought this was fascinating. And it, the finding raises big questions about how stress and trauma affect our ability to remember things, right? Something that is particularly important given our last signal, which suggests that the winners of conflict are so often the people who get to control the memory. And so, um, you know, I guess my question is, is there a way in which thinking about some of the bigger questions about digitizing memory and the need to do that, the value of that. Is there a way to do that that feels equitable? Is, are the 23andMe's of the world, the Facebook of the world, the Ancestry.com, the people who, who I think have become tasked culturally with managing memory and heritage, is there a, is, should they be considering some, maybe some new, and, and to you know, Facebook's credit, I think they do a lot of good work in this, and probably 23andMe as well, um, thinking about how to inject equity in this. If we know that trauma affects memory, do people who come from communities that are traumatized need extra support, need extra outreach when it comes to this? And maybe it's not all about race. Maybe it's about gender. Maybe it's about sexuality. Do we need to think a little bit differently? Is there an intersectional lens that we can apply to this desire to digitize memory? I feel like you need to find the balance between doing something for the sake of equity and mm -hmm. not wanting to re-traumatize a, like a certain population that might not want to remember specific things yeah. that were really harmful to them. Mm -hmm. So I remember growing up, my grandparents never wanted to talk about the Japanese invasion in China because it brought up so many painful memories. And forgetting that was a coping mechanism for them. So I think when brands or like social media platforms think about you know, do we digitize everything? How do we bring, like, history in all formats to the people? You have to be careful and watch out for the population that that might hurt the most. I love that. And candidly, I struggled this image. I, I looked through a lot of images uh, to pull this together because if you are looking, if you jump onto Google and you're looking for something about equitable memory, what you get is photos of, like, dogs being sicked on civil rights protesters, which is, look, we have to remember that. It is valuable to memorialize that, but is that the image that we want to portray? And so maybe what we need to think about is how do you portray the moments that give people that agency, the, the moments of being the first one in your family to graduate from college, buying that home, you know? Like, how do we build that into a sense of equity and memory and not just trauma or whatever? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that, <laughs> that kind of leads into the next sure, sure. signal. Because, <laughs> you know, following up about how memory is political and who has access to actually being able to share memory, uh, there is this uh, collaboration through Super Blue uh, featuring the acclaimed artist JR and a AR community network uh, that has come up with the largest participatory art project in the world. So this is... This interactive platform for people uh, gives people the ability to chronicle their cities by attaching a portrait or personal memory to a particular location, uh, leaving behind digital touch points for others to uncover for years to come. So I think it's interesting in a world where uncertainty is through the roof, rights are being stripped away, and climate anxiety is on the rise. I almost see this technology as a beautiful way of reminding ourselves who we are as communities, what our values are, and our stories that showcases 
our public memory together and gives more of a weight to who we are in those tensions. So I thought this was interesting in parallel to the work that's happening at Good Trust uh, when it comes to your suite of estate products around life stories, because I kind of see it as like the same kind of artistic venture of memorializing our history. Uh, so could you bring this to a brand lens, right? Uh, could you see a B2B wing of Good Trust where you help brands manage their brand estates? Uh, where Because... Brands rise and fall over the years. That's a complete truth. So I wonder if there's a potential value in brands digitally codifying their legacy that they want to leave behind. Wow, fascinating. So, I mean, absolutely. And, and just for, for people's kind of context, so we have for estate planning tools, digital protection software, and then life stories, which is so sort of the pragmatic side of what we offer and then the emotional side. And I think in this case, we're talking about the the legacy of a, a brand, how they want to be perceived, how they want to be remembered. I mean, maybe there are ways that brands could think about their impact on a community and people could interact with, you know, what they've done in that community or some of their customers or something in that space uh, could be highlighted through an app experience or their phone uh, if, it's, if it's AR or something like that. I mean, as you were talking about this, I, what came to mind was like ghosts, right? That it's like you're kind of, these are the ghosts of the, the neighborhoods we live in and, the, yeah. you know, what's, what's come before us, right? And what can we learn from that? And I think that maybe there's a way for brands to tap into, you know, what does that relatability mean? You know, what does geography, what role does geography play in your association with brands? Yeah. 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 I think also just keeping a continued social responsibility in mind, too, um, because some brands do have um, a very bad history, um, especially the bigger ones. So I think also um, just remembering it or raising a question of should they remember they pass, even though maybe the people who are running those brands now weren't part of it, should they still um, try to like resolve those issues or still build their brand further from their past mistakes, whether it be a century ago, even 10 years ago? Um, so I think brand memory is also something to consider yeah. as I well. That's so, so important. I, I mean, what I was thinking too when you were talking, Jen, was like, you know, me memories as a coping mechanism, we all tend to, human nature is to forget some of the bad things that happen to any of us. We don't like to dwell on it. Yeah. We don't want to think about it too much. On the other hand, of course, if we don't learn from those mistakes or those things that happen, then we can't alter our behavior or improve or adapt or whatever it is. So there's this kind of tension that exists. Um, and I know that the photo that you showed before was from the Alzheimer's Association, right? So you have people who then uncontrollably lose their memories. My, it's part of the reason that I was keen to co-found Good Trust. My maternal grandmother died of complications from Alzheimer's. So witnessing somebody go through that and losing their identity is, yeah. is so hard. But it, to, to rationalize that, you know, so for brands to kind of admit maybe or say, hey, we weren't, we're not thrilled about what, some of the things that have happened with us in the past, but we want to call them out and, and acknowledge them um, in this way that's digitized. Anyway, I yeah. could go on. No, I, no it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's important. And, God, this is so funny. I, I was watching, and, and you'll have to indulge me here for a second. I saw an ad recently for Hilton starring Paris Hilton. And I got myself, and I was thinking, I was like, you know, they ran away from her as far as they could when she got super famous in the, in the early 2000s, right? They did not want to be associated with this woman at all. And it's interesting now because in some ways they are embracing that sort of complex history, right? Like Paris Hilton is this like avatar of like spoiled privilege, but she's actually kind of doing some amazing work if you've read about like what she's been up to for the past 10 years. And it is interesting to see a brand like embrace some of their history, some of the more complicated aspects of their history and recognize that like actually maybe we can grow by taking that on uh, in a way that might make us feel more more relevant to others. So there's definitely some some upside to that, perhaps difficult work. I mean, you can imagine the pitch in the room with the Hilton family being like, we want to bring in Paris. And the, you know, the, the Hilton C-suite being do it going, you want to do what? <laughs> you know? But shout out to Paris Hilton. Take a risk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, so, speaking of complex family histories. <laughs> that's what I was going to talk about, because the next signal... <laughs> um, this really connects to the net aid spirituality EOC here because, you know, when we think about our legacies or we think about the afterlife or how we, you know, deal with death, spirituality, religion comes into, into play. So Christianity Today uh, said that the He Gets Us campaign has spent $100 million um, donated, you know, by a small group of wealthy anonymous families uh, to rebrand the digital memory and public perception of Jesus for Gen Z. So when it comes to digitizing memories, the, the discussion of the legacy 
of book-based religions, I believe it is inherent to the conversation to the culture of memory, because memory is sacred. So the ad directs viewers to this website called hegetsus.com, where they can choose four ways to engage with the digital memory of Jesus' story. You can chat live, text for prayer and positive vibes, sign up to join a small group with Alpha, or click through to a Bible reading plan on YouVerse's app. So for me, the reason why this is fascinating is because I went to an evangelical Christian school, and I spent hours studying theology. So I think this is interesting when it comes to how we curate our digital, our past, and what that effect can be. So I know that we talked about this a little bit earlier, Ketsi, you were talking about, you know, brands don't always have the most beautiful histories. So I'm wondering if we can push that conversation a little further as well when it comes to, you know, how do we curate a digital legacy that actually helps us move forward from problematic pasts? Is there a way to actually do that? Or should brands really sidestep and try to create new narratives uh, that don't get too deep into the touchy waters of problematic pasts? I, th I think that when you mentioned religion and memory, that was really interesting in digitizing memory because I think with religion, it's so broad that they, they can be a number of different perspectives within one religion, and that's why they're denominations. And I feel like there's also a lot of contention um, with how the past is written, even, the, in, even in the very general stories, like um, the race of Jesus, for example, and, and that sort of thing. So I, I think if we were to digitize religious memory um, and if we were to gain some traction, there would probably be a, num a number of more startups um, coming, coming to light and kind of doing the same thing, but with a, with a different narrative, but from the same, same religion. So I feel like if that would happen, there would probably be denominations of that memory from religion. Nice. I, like that. I also think for Gen Zers, like, look, they don't want to be told what to do. And so, like, literally, like, you're getting someone, okay, so that one of the options you said was a, um, like, a Bible reading path, right? But, I don't know, shouldn't you pick your own Bible reading? Do you really want someone to tell you to start with Ecclesiastes? Like, like maybe you should figure that out on your own, or maybe you want to hear that from someone you know more who's like, oh, I think you'll really respond well to this passage or, or, or whatever. So, I, I, I mean, rebranding Jesus They've tried that a lot. <laughs> it's like it's like Jurassic Park, but they're going to keep making them. <laughs> We're going to keep doing it. No, um, but I do think that that sense of agency that like everybody has their own spiritual path. Gen Zers aren't necessarily not spiritual; they're just not particularly religious. And so that idea where it's like, I want to figure out how to digitize my own. I want to figure out my own digital path for my religious memory and what values I pull from that, that's transformative, not necessarily being like, here's a million apps that will pick up you know, a Bible verse for you or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I wonder how much value there is in the, in the discovery aspect of it. So you know, I would consider myself to be a person of faith, but not, I don't know everything about every religion. I know as much as I've learned from reading and traveling and you know, talking to others. But I wonder if in the, in the digitizing memory part, what if you could have, for example, a, a conversation with, with a hologram of Jesus, uh, as, as accurate as, uh, as anybody wanted to try to create and, and represent, uh, and, and ask questions, um, just learn a bit more. Do you associate with what you know, Jesus is saying? And do we all agree that this is sort of you know, uh, the right way to you know, show Jesus to people? Or what if you could talk to, uh, I don't know, a representation of the Muslim faith or uh, you know, somebody of the Jewish faith or just something that gives you better visibility into uh, religion and that, that's kind of bringing the past uh, to light in this kind of way. So it's adding a layer of technology to, to yeah. that experience. I don't know. Um, I, you know yeah. I, just to add on that, that gets me really excited to, I don't know, to think about an AI Jesus or, yeah. <laughs> or just like an AI representation of faith because I think that's what's missing so often for young people who grow up in conservative environments where they want to know the history so that they can form their beliefs, but so much of that history is clouded by individual interpretation and trauma surrounding that religious space. Mm -hmm. So if there is things like an AI Jesus where I can ask you know, him, like, what happened, you know, in 1 Corinthians this? And AI Jesus is like, yo, this is what happened. Here's a historical context without any sort of lens. I think that would be really interesting. Um, think, yeah. um, going off of what Matt yeah. said, um, I was thinking of it from two different perspectives. 
you could ask one question, well, then who would be controlling the AI? Who would be right. um, creating that algorithm? But then there could even be a more logical part if you are using AI and you were to say, what was the history during this time? Maybe they could pull things from Google or, or, or credible sites um, to even um, sort of add to that accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, our spiritual advisor. Our spiritual advisor, yeah. I had uh, one of the things that we heard from, and kind of building on Ketsy's point, from our, we did a briefing that was around Gen Z, interested in the multi, uh, what's it called? Not the multiverse. The metaverse. metaverse. <laughs> they can be interested uh, in both. They can I'm be interested in both, of course. And uh, one of the, real themes that we heard was an interest in an independent sort of regulatory body with a lot of these emerging technologies. So in the sense that you're playing in kind of a new space, can you share for other people in the newer space, like what sort of regulations are you facing or what is it kind of the Wild West? Can you talk about independent regulation of these sort of privatized digital memory tech? I mean, it is a little wild west, I would say, at the moment. Uh, you know, especially with regards to sort of verification of somebody's identity or who they are. I mean, there are a lot of rules, of course, governing you know privacy and uh, security of data, and you know we take that incredibly seriously. We're a company that does ask people to share something about themselves, and then we need to secure that and, and store it. So there are kind of existing regulations around a lot of that. But when it comes to people's memories and uh, how it's preserved and how it's passed on. You know, we have, for example, we have rules around who would have access to your good trust profile after you pass away. Mm -hmm. so, so you create a, a representation of yourself and all of your memories and everything you think kind of embodies who you are. And you can nominate people, we call them a legacy contact or a trusted contact who has access to all of this. And, you know, what if somebody else wants it? Or what if that person... To nominate somebody else? And so these are, kinds of, these are kind of real-world examples of where we're heading into. Um, you know, if, if you see a version of yourself somewhere, you know, do you feel like that is you or not? I mean, it's a little surreal to kind of think about this, your, your kind of mm. digital clone or mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. twin, right? But it is funny, as we, as we jump into the final signal, it is funny to, to realize that there is a valuable intersection here where it's like, Faith and spirituality are incredibly important for processing existential questions, and how you want to be remembered is like a, is perhaps the most one of the most fundamental of those existential questions. So it does make sense that there is some cultural energy to understand, like in memory tech, which someone said earlier, which I think is amazing, like that there probably needs to be some that there is there's a natural overlap between spiritual tech and memory tech, right? right. Do you have one last thing? Right? Yeah, one last thing. Um, I think it was also interesting that you said that. Um, especially if you think of um, France, for example, if, if they um, mined, uh, mined data on someone, um, if they were to die, would they still have right to maybe use that data um, to inform how um, people who have passed on, uh, what, are, what are the antics around that? Um, is there valuable data behind that? Maybe a strategy to console people um, and, and just things around that. Um, would brands have access and how would they use it and if there's any regulation around that? Absolutely. The ethics of digitizing memory, and I guess there's a whole spectrum of everything from like regulations right mm -hmm. through to sort of you know morality. What should you do or not do? So yeah, I love yeah. the idea that you're using market research data, and like one of the segmentations is dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, cool. Let's act, let's let's talk about death. Um, so Taver Knies uh, connects two disparate ideas. In an interesting final signal for us here, Knies writes, quote, An emerging the emerging field of death tech is capitalizing on, such, um, on anxiety by pitching individual immortality such as deep fakes and AI-driven chatbots. Meanwhile, we're facing an ongoing environmental catastrophe perpetuated by colonialism and relentless extraction. These two forms of existential uncertainty may seem separate, but they're intrinsically related. Kines goes on to note that um, the, the posthumous chatbot that maybe you want to set up, a futuristic you know, me bit of memory tech, um, quote, is only as good as the upkeep and someone has to pay for domain names, delete spam, you know, the energy needed to run it in a server, the water needed to cool the server, you know, there's a, the food for the security guard, like there's a, this spirals, you know? Um, some, and, and, you know, that there is an interesting tension there, basically, that Kinesis points out. And she goes on to, you know, to talk about a sci-fi novel about this. But ultimately, is it like, she kind of hints that, like, you're kind of colonizing the future, right? If you're like, I want to be remembered, and I want to do it in such a way that it's going to require a lot of work from people. And it got me thinking very quickly about that book, SPQR, that was really big for a while, about, like, Roman society. And, like, one thing that I didn't know is part of the reason that we know so much about the Romans isn't just that they left a lot of stuff 
and kept a lot of really good records. It's that it was very in vogue, even if you were poor in ancient Rome, to have these really built out, not headstones, they had these like basically plaques that were made of brass that people wrote out their whole, they're like, he worked here, he had a wife, he didn't like her that much, he got a girlfriend, like they really got into it, you know? And that's like a really critical slice of life for us understanding it. It, it sits in such contrast to like the granite headstone with just your name and your date and saying like, you know, beloved son or, or whatever. So I, I am interested in this idea about it. I would love to unpack this a little bit about like, when is enough enough, you know? Like, do we want, how long can we digitize memory for? Do we need to think more about like the analog ones too? Is there, a, is there an ethical place we need to draw a line here? And, you know, I mean, I, Daniel, I got to start with you. Sorry. <laughs> no. I mean, I think there's a place for all sorts of memories, whether it's oral, written, digital, right? I mean, I think we need to remember that there are uh, stuff that can, there's stuff that can only be passed on through storytelling and, you know, in person, something that you remember. Um, you know, there's that uh, idea that you, you die twice or even three times. There's when your physical body dies. There's when nobody remembers who you are anymore. And then there's maybe when there's no trace of your digital existence at this point, right, right. when you're totally gone. So um, we worry about that. I think it's a natural fear and anxiety to think about what happens after we're gone. So, uh, however, to your point, there, you know, is anything really permanent? Does anything really live forever? Are we chasing this idea of immortality for yeah. reasons that are a little too consumed about ourselves? Mm -hmm. and, and how much of you know, any of this is more about passing this on to future generations? So whatever works for you, if digital's better, if oral's better, video, you know, whatever it is, but passing on whatever we've learned and how to empower the next generation, I guess, is maybe an idealized way of looking at it, rather than, I want to be remembered as kind yeah. of like me, right? And then it all becomes about the self. You think about that poem of, about Ozymandias yeah. and like the broken, uh, the broken statue, and, uh, who wrote, was that Keats? Who wrote that? It's one of those writers yeah. wrote it, and, you know, the famous, that the, he paints this painting of uh, these, like, two stone legs, and under the tablet it says, like, all, like, all hail Ozymandias, king of kings, yeah. and you look at it and you're like, this kingdom is ruined, no one's here, like, you're not actually a king for all that long, you know? Something that came to mind with that, too, one of the first things that I thought of um, was algorithms, when you said, um, how long do we actually want to be remembered for? I think a lot of it depends on how involved you actually want to be uh, how much you want to be involved with your devices. Um, so some people um, would want it from the beginning, like the more involved you are, the better your algorithms are, the better your experiences are. And I think with that, it could benefit maybe the people you know in the future who would like to get to know you better. I don't know if anyone watches um, Black Mirror, that Be Right Back episode where um, it collected all of her boyfriends, her deceased boyfriend's data, and she basically ended up dating him again. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's just about... Um, the amount of involvement you want to have with your devices. And I think for the people who don't in the future, would they have to consider um, if that's an ethical decision um, for the people who may want to remember them in the future? Mm -hmm. Ugh, God, yeah. being buried with your cell phone. <laughs> I think it's also people, you know, contending with the fear of, like, not being in control even after they're gone. So sure. they come up with, like, a plethora of services, whether that's digital or natural, to be remembered. So, like, I see this as one on one end of the spectrum and the other end is like people wanting to be buried in a tree pod or be turned into mushrooms and that mm -hmm. you're living in perpetuity with yeah. nature so i think it's like a this and that and not so much digital or natural yeah matt why don't you share Yep. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I was thinking about too is like, how immersive do you want your legacy to be, and for how long? I kind of see it as like this funnel that you're talking about, where maybe as soon as you die, there's a very immersive experience of memorial, where you can go into the metaverse and learn more about whatever, and like that takes up all of the different things that we're talking about when it comes to resources. But as time passes on, it becomes more so of a byline or an abstract of who you are, and that aids the general understanding for those in the future of who we were yeah. now, so. Well, uh, th I think we could probably, I'm literally sitting here being like, you could probably teach a seminar about this. Um, it's been an amazing conversation to have like for a whole semester at a liberal arts college. Um, let's do some quick roundups. I'm just curious, we'll keep it really simple, what your big takeaways for the day are. I think my big takeaway is I love this term memory tech. I think we need to apply it to more spaces. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's something that social media 
uh, platforms that I think a little bit uh, more about. Jen, what's your big takeaway from today? My takeaway, I guess memory is fluid and multi-sensory, so I'm curious to see the innovations in that space where tech could kind of mirror the fluidity and also you know, think beyond just audio and visual because so much of memory is like smell and touch. So like, how do we capture that? I love that. Daniel, what's your big takeaway from today's briefing? Yeah, I love the points around sort of the, the cost of memory, meaning, you know, the cost of remembering something or, or not, yeah. um, and the, uh, the sensitivities around uh, memory as it relates to different ethnic groups or uh, our own uh, demographic or whatever it is. Um, how do we learn from all of that yeah. going forward? What are the best ways to think about digitizing memory? Love that. Cassie? Um, I think memory as a commodity is really interesting. I think um, how, brands could, um, how brands could use uh, memories, how um, if there's regulation around that, um, could loved ones have access to your memory too? Could you sell your memory as an NFT? Could people buy your memories and, oh and use it as, as oh their own? Okay. I'm, I'm yeah. taking it far. But um, I think, I think it being, I think, it being used in that way is really interesting um, and even possible to some degree uh, the, the more we talk about it and the more the metaverse emerges. Uh, mm. Lovely. No, no, that's a perfect briefing moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Matt, <laughs> final that's thoughts? Big this one. Uh, for me, memory is propaganda that shapes the future. So what we give power to when it comes to memory shapes the type of imagination that we have for the future. So positive mm. propaganda. Mm. Uh, Daniel, uh, if people are interested in your uh, in your in your startup, where can they go for more information? I appreciate the shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> MyGoodTrust.com is our uh, domain. We're on all sorts of different uh, social media, and uh, it's uh, free to sign up and uh, create an account. And we'd love to hear from people about what they what they think and how they're experiencing it. Incredible! I hope a lot of people are uh, are moved to do so. Amazing! Thank you for joining us. Thank you to to Matt, to Ketsy, to Daniel. And to Jen, thank uh, everybody in the audience, including our very special guests. Uh, thank you for joining us online. You can join us Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday on our LinkedIn page. While you're there, jump in the comment section. Let us know your existential thoughts on, uh, on memory uh, and on uh, all the topics we discussed today. If you're interested in Q, the cultural intelligence platform we use to build today's briefings, please feel free to reach out. We would love to give you a demo of it. It is incredibly value, valuable, whether we're talking about things that feel super concrete or the uh, perhaps the here after. Tomorrow, we're going to do an awesome briefing about uh, music and storytelling. Uh, we have another great guest. Uh, this is a week of like, kick, you know, amazing guests. <laughs> so uh, definitely tune in for that. And until then, consider yourselves briefed. Period.